The Last Ride of Roy Wilson. The finale. Let's get straight into that. Our last day in Del Rio had spent gathering supplies, bullets and rations for our last ride out. I couldn't say just how much good it might do us, but it was all we could do to prepare. As soon as we had made it back to town with Henry and Michaela, Cooper looked down near ready to collapse. Starkman and I had needed to help the man off his horse once we made it to the inn. You look like death warmed over, Marshal. The doc had said, you should stay here. Let us handle Kennedy and Jones. I'll let you have all the fun, Cooper asked, still wearing that damn smile. The hell I will. We'll leave in the morning and finish this right. And I could tell Starkman didn't approve, but he knew as well as I did that Cooper's mind was made up. His attention shifted over to Henry, who'd lingered like a whipped dog behind us. And you, kid, you get on out of here. At the sound of Marshall's voice, the boy perked up a bit. What? Ah, you heard me. Put Del Rio behind you, boy. And don't you ever look back. Y you mean that, Marshall? Cooper, what the hell are you doing? Starkman asked. Just hush up, Doc. Go on, Henry. He gave the boy a nod and I swear I saw the kid's eyes light right up. Sh sure thing, Marshal. Thank you. The way he ran from us told me he'd likely been waiting for a chance to do so for a while. Michaela watched him as he ran, scoffing at the sight of it. You out of your damn mind, Marshal? Starkman snapped. He's gonna go straight for Kenneth and Jones. No, he ain't, Cooper replied. He knows damn well they're likely to kill him if he does. Just let it be, Doc. And Starkman grimaced and looked over to see Henry on the street. Glancing back at us to make sure we weren't giving chase, he spat in the dirt and shook his head. And Cooper's attention shifted to Michaela next. Ah, we could likely use someone who knows a thing or two about the unnatural. I don't suppose you mind a trip to the mountains. As a matter of fact, I would, she replied. Much as I might not mind watching you kneel over and ride over, just the smell of you tells me your blood's no good anymore and the rest of you. And she exhaled a dry laugh. <sighs> well, I won't lie to you about your chest, but I do wish you well. Besides, my kind prefers to stay by the water. It's far too dry out where you're headed. That's so. Cooper asked. Well, for what it's worth, thank you for all you've done for us. I'd say I hope we meet again under better circumstances, but, well. Taking it in your stride, huh, cowboy? She asked. I suppose I can't blame you. Too many of you dime book cowboy type died to happenstance or misfortune. Shot in the back of the head just like Jesse James, without ever knowing their day had come. I'd choose the same as you if it were up to me. Better to have one last fight and with your head high and go out in a blaze of glory. And I hope it's everything you wanted, Marshal. And Cooper just smiled at her and tipped his hat one last time. Michaela did the same before she turned her horse and rode back towards the waterfront. And just like that, it was just the three of us again, staring down something so big we didn't know if we could take it. And knowing we were going to do so anyway. June 20th, 1887. We left El Rio at dawn, right in due west to the Chisos. We crossed the border, cutting through Mexico to save time. Cooper was hardly in any condition to ride the day and a half it would have taken to make it there, and we were fixing to waste as little time as possible. It was late afternoon when we saw the mountains looming before us, and dusk had started to set in as we drew nearer. The sun wasn't even down when we saw a plume of dust in the distance from an explosion of some sort, and Starkman paused to stare at it. You reckon that's them? he asked. 
Well, that thing we spoke to said they were digging. I replied, well, if I was looking to dig something out real quick, I'd want dynamite. Stagman huffed in agreement before he kept riding. Cooper liked it a pace behind us, dead silent and white as a ghost. He didn't complain, and with a stern yet resolute look on his face. I knew he was saving every ounce of strength he had left for the coming fight, and were I in his shoes, I might have done the same. It was another hour before we saw the dust of another explosion, all but confirming where a quarry awaited. I caught Stagman cutting ahead of us, eager to get to the fight. The sky had an orange glow, as if it had been set ablaze when we reached the mountains. The sound of the last dynamite blast had been close and we could hear the voices of men shouting amongst themselves. We took advantage up on a high ridge to look down at where Jones and Kennard's gang were excavating. And sure enough, there was a tunnel leading deep into one of the mountains, and by our account, about eight men working in the area. I spotted a bulky figure, and I was sure it must have been Jonesy amongst them. He seemed to be speaking with a fellow I assumed to be his second, in command, before noticing a tenth figure leaving one of the tents that set up. And I recognized them as Primrose Kennard immediately. Well, looks like the gang's all here. Starkman said. So, how are we going to play this? Uh, we come at them with Kennard and Jones on the field, and we're all dead, Cooper replied. We know Jones won't die easy, and he'll go down guarding Kennard. I'll uh, be careful with how we deal with that woman too, I said. I don't think it was a stray bullet that nicked me in the back of the church. I took aim at the woman. I fired and I'm the one who got hit. She's got some sort of protection. Oh, is that it? Starkman asked before sighing. Well, shit. Did we just ride out here without a fucking plan? Duck, when you figure out how to kill a man who can shake off having his head blown to bits, you let me know. I snapped at Starkman. He was quiet for a moment, as if he was genuinely thinking on that. And down below, Kennard and Jones seemed to speak for a moment, before turning and heading for the hole in the mountain. I saw two of their gang following them in. They're heading inside, Cooper noted before readying his Winchester. The hell are you doing? I asked. That right there, son? That's a window. Plus, if that woman is going into that cave, then you can bet your ass that they are close to the temple. We're short of time. The marshal steadied his aim and fixed one of the gang members in his sights. As he did, Starkman got up and headed down the ridge. I watched him for a moment, almost calling after him before thinking better of it. Ah, well, shit. I guess we're doing this. I said under my breath, before following him down. I can't say it was much of a plan, but, hell, if it wasn't all that we had. I don't suppose you've got an idea beyond going in our guns blazing? I asked Starkman as I caught up to him. They've got dynamite down there, a lot from the looks of it. If we can get into the cave, then we can rid the cave outright and bury those sons of bitches under the mountain. He replied. Oh, that's your plan? I asked. And if it doesn't work? Then we'll kill him the old-fashioned way. As we neared the bottom of the ridge, I heard the first of Cooper's gunshots. And down in the little encampment of Jones' gang, I saw a man hit the ground hard, dead on his feet or not, that Marshall could still shoot. Starkman slid down part of the ridge and dove for cover behind a rock. I joined him. Jones' men had their eyes up on the ridge, looking for Marshall. They were sitting ducks for us. Starkman fired first. His first couple of shots caught one of the men in the chest. The poor bastard belly had time to cry out before he hit the ground. It's an ambush, one of the men cried. I set my sights on him. It was hardly a crack shot, but I got him in the leg. The four surviving members of Jones's gang scrambled for cover. Cooper's rifle fired again, striking down another of them as he tried to get to safety. And from the cave, I spotted the two men who got in with Jones and Kennard when an out to investigate. I emptied my six-gun in their direction. One of them fell back, clutching at his neck. 
His companion only spared him a glance before diving for cover. A bullet struck the rock I'd taken cover behind and I dug my head low to avoid another shot that might have taken my head off. Starkman abandoned our cover for a better position and I could hear a few desperate, blind gunshots sounding off but as far as I could tell, none of them had hit anything. Cooper's rifle sounded again, echoing through the mountains. I poked out from my cover to see one of Jonesy's boys making a run for the tents, and I put him down before he could get there. And from the corner of my eye, I spotted another one of the gangsters getting a new window in his skull, courtesy of Starkman. And by my count, we now had the advantage of numbers, and those boys, <laughs> they knew it. Back in the temple! I heard one of them call him before Cooper's rifle silenced him. I could see the last man running from the cavern, and he had just made it through the mouth before several bullets tore through his back. I saw Starkman standing amongst the carnage, his gun in his hand, and I aimed at the mouth of the cave, his eyes burning with a fury as he reloaded his revolver. I could see Cooper heading down the ridge to join us, and reloaded as I waited for him. They didn't seem too tough. I heard a breathless Cooper say as he made it to my side. He looked damn near ready to collapse and stop beside me to catch his breath. I didn't need to remind him that they weren't the ones we'd been worried about. Starkman had headed for the tents, no doubt looking for dynamite, although his eyes kept anxiously darting towards the mouth of the cave, and I knew damn well why. In the darkness, I could see movement. Something in the shape of a man coming out of the shadows, drawn by the silence after the storm. Daniel Jones, or at least what used to be Daniel Jones, emerged from the cave. His face looked hmm, twisted, as if it were held together by stitches. It wasn't even his own face anymore. I barely recognized it as a face of the man that I stabbed a few days prior, although I had no doubt that it was Jones that it was attached to. Cooper raised his Winchester up at the man while Starkman kept his revolver trained on him. And here I hoped I might have seen the last of you, Marshal, Jones said. His voice sounded wet as if he were choking on his own mucus. Mr. Jones, you ain't gonna see the end of me until you hang for all you've done, Cooper replied. And to that, Jonesy just offered a crooked smile. Uh, you'll have a hard time with that, Marshal. I ain't so sure you could even hang a man like me, even if you tried. You didn't forget now, did you? I'm a little different than before, thanks to Miss Kennard. And Jonesy took a drunken step towards us, not even bothering to go for his gun. That's the reward for helping her with her apotheosis, you see. By dawn tomorrow, Marshal, there'll be a new god in this world, and I will be her divine right hand. I walk now as a lion amongst sheep, and all of you are not more than prey, made to be consumed. And before the words could leave his mouth, Cooper fired his rifle and put a bullet straight through Jonesy's new head. Dark, pulpy gore erupted from the back of it, although the man hardly seemed to notice, nor did he notice when Starkman emptied his pistol into his head and chest. Bits of bone and flesh were launched aside, and if the old Jonesy was laughing, it was nothing more than a distorted wheeze amongst the gunfire that downright obliterated his skull. Cooper fired another round into his chest, and still, it had no effect. Dark, the dynamite, he called, and Starkman wasted no time in heading back for the tents. Jonesy remained standing and hastily drew for his pistol. I hadn't thought he even could shoot in his current state. I can't imagine Cooper or Starkman had either. He squeezed off just one shot towards the tents. Only one, but it was enough. The explosion of dynamite knocked Cooper and myself off our feet and sent Starkman utterly flying. I hid the ground hard and lay on the ground stunned for a moment before I noticed Jonesy advancing on us. He shrugged off his heavy duster, revealing pale and rotten bare flesh beneath it. Just like that thing in a barn, he was held together by little more than stitches, and his body looked bloated and swollen. 
He stopped only briefly before one of his own dead men, and I watched as his belly seemed to split open like a twisted, toothless maw, and fleshy red tendrils gripped the corpse of the dead man and pulled it into him with a sickening, sucking sound. As it did, I watched the remains of Jonesy's head fall away uselessly onto the ground as a new head in that of the man he was currently eaten rose up in its place. His eyes opened alive with a new life and fixated on me as that more in his stomach swallowed the dead man whole and closed up again. Hi there, Roy, he said, his voice even more gobbled than before. He raised his gun at me and I moved, scrambling for cover before he fired. Come to hunt me down again, have you? I heard Jonesy tease. Well, this time ain't gonna go so well as it did when you turned traitor on Blake. No, sir. And I could hear the sound of Cooper's Winchester firing and a grunt of frustration from Jonesy. I moved from behind cover, praying to a god. I might have shot, and I did. The hand that had once been Jonesy's gun was little more than a bloody stump that he clutched. His focus had shifted to Cooper, a short distance away, and he didn't notice me until it was too late. I emptied my revolver into his head, knowing it wasn't going to kill him, but not giving half a damn. And behind Cooper, I could see Starkman up on his feet, scraped up and worse for wear, but alive. Cooper fired his Winchester again, and the force of the bullet sent Jonesy back a step, and I heard him hiss at that, disgusting more in his stomach cold open again. Jesus fucking Christ! Cooper spat before shooting at the moor. It did no more good than shooting him anywhere else. And Jonesy went for his other gun, and Starkman pulled Cooper down into cover. His few shots thankfully missed, and I took the opportunity to put some distance between myself and the Colossus of flesh that used to be Jonesy. He stood still for a moment before leisurely lumbering over to the corpse of another one of his dead men. The red tendrils in his stomach's maw ensnared that corpse before beginning to pull it into him. And I knew what would happen next. Whatever was left of his old hand dropped off as the hand of the dead man he'd just consumed grew in its place. The damage done to his head was filled with bits from the head of the man that he was consuming. Go ahead, boys. Shoot me again. Might actually do something this time, he hissed. Y'all gonna run out of ammo eventually. I spotted Starkman gesturing to me a few feet away and I ran to join him. Jonesy raised his pistol to take a shot at me and just barely missed me by a hair. He just chuckled playfully before plunging a hand into that sick maw in his stomach and pulling out the gun of the man he'd just eaten. Now if you got any idea on how to kill this son of a bitch, now's the fucking time. Starkman snarled at me. Cooper leaned against the rock beside him, struggling to breathe and clutching his Winchester with a death grip. I'm thinking on that, I replied. Jonesy's eyes were fixated on our new hiding spot and I knew we didn't have long before we needed to run. And a few feet away from him, I spotted another corpse. One of the men shot down by Cooper. He had a few pale sticks of dynamite looped into his belt. Well, could you think a little harder? God damn it, Starkman said. I looked back at him. Duck, Cooper, get his attention and then blow his head off again. Well, that ain't exactly working so far, Roy, Cooper rasped. Just trust me, God damn it, go. Well, I shooed him away and Starkman swore under his breath before darting out from behind the rock. He fired a few stray rounds at Jones. Hey, you yellow son of a bitch. Yellow, Jonesy replied. His malformed head turning to follow Starkman before he fired on him. He caught Starkman in the shoulder and sent him down. A poor chase of last words, sir, he said, keeping his gun trained on him. You're sure you won't reconsider? 
and Starkman kept his gun on Jonesy and fired at him until his pistol clicked. Jonesy just grinned down at him, knowing it didn't matter one bit. I might if you still got ears to hear him. As soon as the words left his mouth, Cooper emerged from behind the rock. He fired twice, both bullets hitting their mark, and for the third time that day, relieving Jonesy of his head. Starkman rolled himself out of the way as Jonesy fired at the spot where he'd been, before trying to aim his gun at Cooper. While he was distracted, I moved, running for the nearby corpse that I'd seen. I knew I didn't have much time before Jonesy noticed me, and I made for the most of it. Cooper emptied his Winchester into Jonesy's body before diving back to cover as Jonesy angrily fired at him. He let out a wet popping noise before his guns were finally trained on me. As I saw his arm move, I scurried out of the way and watched as Jonesy lumbered over to the corpse I'd just been standing over. I prayed he would have noticed the hiss and the crackle of the lit dynamite. You're starting to, uh, starting to annoy me. He said through a half a mouth, as that moor in his stomach opened up again. You have long since crossed the line between bravery and suicide. How much longer can we play this game? And the red tendrils gripped the corpse of the dead man and pulled him in, head first into that moor in his stomach. Bits of the new head grew to replace the ones that were lost, but as they did, I saw Jonesy's eyes widening in horror as he realized, too late, what was going on. Wait! No! Frantically, he dropped his guns and tried to grab the body as that hole in his stomach consumed it. And I could see the more wretched as if trying to spit up the corpse, but it's... I was too late. The explosion tore through Jonesy, and there wasn't a damn thing he could do to stop it. One moment he was whole, the next it was nothing but a small crater, in a cloud of dust where he stood not moments ago. I saw the top half of him, launched away and dashed violently against one of the rocks strewn around. And then all was quiet. Starkman picked himself up slowly, clutching at the wound in his shoulder before stumbling towards Cooper so he could check on him. I kept an eye on them before approaching the remains of Jonesy, hoping to God that he was truly dead. I should have known better. His eyes followed me as I approached him. He had only one arm left and a half-formed, already wounded head, and what remained of his chest was nothing but a ragged mess through which I could see his beating heart, and it beat ever faster as I approached him. Damn you! Damn you! I heard him rasp, bitter and defiant to the end. Jalla bastard! I ain't the one dying in the dirt, Jonesy. I replied before replacing my boot over his beaten heart. His hand gripped my ankle, but he wasn't strong enough to stop me. Not anymore. When you see Blake Hayes, you tell him. You tell him I said hello. I pressed down on his heart and felt it break under my foot, and Josie's eyes went wide and twitched. His mouth opened and closed as he struggled to scream, and then he was silent. I wiped my boot off in the dirt and spat on him, before turning to check on Starkwin and Cooper. Ah, Cooper looked all right, but Starkwin looked like he'd seen better days. He put a rag over his wound and was keeping pressure on it as best he could. How bad is it? I asked. He grazed me, Starkman replied. The ears are still ringing from the dynamite though. Christ, please tell me that fucker is dead. He's dead, I replied, and watched as calm entered the doctor's eyes. Thank God. Cooper looked towards the mouth of the cave, and his eyes narrowed. We're down to just one now, he said, before setting his Winchester down. He drew his revolver and let out a tense exhale. <sighs> I don't suppose we have enough dynamite to just bury her? Jones blew it out of hell, Starkman said as he tied a bandage onto his arm. We're doing this the old-fashioned way. And Cooper nodded slowly. Lynn, 
Let's get to it, then. I helped Stark went to his feet as Cooper started towards the mouth of the cave, and we followed him. Oil lamps led our path deep into the bowels of the mountain, and that heavy silence was back. There wasn't a soul alive in there save for us, and perhaps Kennard herself. I can't recall just how far we went or how deep the path into the mountain ran. We could have been walking for hours or even days. Those moments just blended together, like a surreal dream. It wasn't until we heard the sound of running water drawing ever closer that we knew we were at our destination. The tunnel opened into a darkened chamber, lit by torchlight. Water cascaded down convex stone walls, coming up from a pitch-black source just above us. A small pathway leading over a gently flowing river led us to the centre of the chamber, and in its centre was Primrose Kennard. She wore an ornate red dress that flowed around her as she danced with a favour that seemed inhuman. And there was a violence in every single one of her motions as she moved. She hadn't seemed to notice us, not yet at least, but Starkman was quick to change that. Kennard! He snarled, and at that sound of his voice, she stopped. She turned, fixing us with a furious glare, as she watched us draw nearer to her. And Starkman kept his gun on her, as if it posed any real threat to her. You've taken a lot from me. I'd very much like to return the favor, he said. What a selfish notion. In the face of something far greater than yourself, she replied. Vladimir Starkman, isn't it? Igor's brother. Don't you dare say his name, Starkman growled as he spoke. Her lips curled into a grin. You really think that you're going to exact some sort of revenge upon me? Is that it? You imagined you'd chase me down, interrupt my apotheosis, and... What? Kill me? Bring me back to San Antonio and hang me? Her eyes darted between myself and Cooper. Ah, that was the idea, Cooper said. But after all the trouble we've been through, I'm content to leave your corpse to rot down here. By all means, Marshal, shoot me, she said for a moment. I was sure that Cooper was going to try it. Instead, he took a step to water. If I thought that might end well, I would, he said. Primrose Kennard, I am placing you under arrest for the murder of John Str- As he advanced on her, Kennard's eyes seemed to flash. The ground beneath her shook as the darkness above her seemed to come alive. A great droning filled my ears, like heaven's trumpet sounding, and in the void behind her, I saw a great red glow from behind the shimmering water. Arrest, Kennard laughed, her voice echoing through the chamber, just as loud as the droning. How quaint! You'll not stop my apotheosis, gentlemen, but since you've come so far, I will allow you to witness it. And through the flowing water behind her, I could see a great red cross in the sky. Shall. Kennard twirled, resuming her frantic dance as I fell to my knees. And beside me, I could see Starkman clutching his head and screaming as Cooper looked up into the great visage of Shal. I couldn't will myself to move. The great cross from the abyss held sway over me. I couldn't even look away. And Kennard's violent movements seemed to blur together as they did. I saw a pair of great stone doors slide open on the far side of the dome chamber. Beyond them was a darkness so complete that it seemed like a void. Kennard's dance came to a close as she stared into the doors before she looked back at us. The droning grew louder and louder, and as I looked into that darkness, I knew that Charles awaited beyond it. Come, I heard Kennard say. Witness the ascent of your new god! And grinning from ear to ear, she strode confidently through the doors and into that darkness that swallowed her whole. The droning of Shaul did not fade, nor did it weaken. I don't know how I found the strength to stand, but somehow I did. Cooper, I called, my voice barely breaking past the noise. Starkman, come on! And Starkman was on his hands and knees, blood dribbling from his ears. At the sound of his name, he looked up 
seemingly disorientated before he finally stood. And Cooper was the last of us to rise and he looked into that darkness and with a fear I understood all too well. And then he stepped forward, towards it, and together we entered the abyss. The first thing I noticed was silence. The droning was gone. The sky above us was a hazy pink and yet it seemed wrong, unnatural somehow. It took me a few moments to recognize the space we stood in. It looked different on the other side. We'd come out in the same chamber we entered through, only this one looked as if it had been blown to pieces. The mountain that had been on top of us was gone, giving us a clear view of the sky. And I could see bits of rock floating lazily through the air as if gravity had no effect on them. Stagwan blinked in disbelief as he surveyed the area around us before noticing Kenneth a few feet away and she stared up at the pink sky, still smiling wide. You should be on it, she said without looking back at us. Only a few have ever set foot in the abyss while still alive. It's beautiful, isn't it? And Cooper raised his revolver and aimed it at her back and she didn't even acknowledge him. Whatever you're doing, it stops now, he said, his voice barely a wheeze. It's far too late to stop this, Marshal, Kenneth said, but I will be a merciful god. Put down your gun and I might even be so kind as to give you back your life. I can hear it in your voice, see it in your face. You made a deal with the old fae, didn't you? Gave up your life. Just for a shot at me? What a waste. But soon, once I have the power of Shal, I can undo it. The old Fey may be powerful, but I will be even greater than them. And she turned to face us at last, her eyes bright. Put down your gun, Marshal. There's a new world coming. Embrace it. And Cooper just kept his pistol aimed at her. His eyes met hers and he excelled before he pulled the trigger. He fired three shots before he collapsed backwards, with three stains of blood growing on his chest, and Kenneth watched him fall with an indifference. So be it then, she said. Your choice is made. And with that, she turned back to look up at the pink sky and raised her hands. A crimson bolt of lightning came down from the heavens and connected with her palm. And Kenneth let out a cry of pain. Her knees seemed to give out and she nearly collapsed, but she kept her hand outstretched. Her apotheosis had begun. No, Starkman cried. He ran for her, probably trying to tackle her, to stop her somehow, but another bolt of crimson lightning struck the ground in front of him and lodged him back a step. Kenneth rose to her feet, swaying drunkenly as the crimson power flowed through her, and she looked back at Starkman, her vicious grin returned. And you, you wanted revenge, she crooned. Her voice had gained a hint of an echo. I think I'll destroy you first. And she advanced on him as he lay in a heap on the ground before a single final gunshot rang out through the abyss. Blood erupted from Kenneth's head, crackling with electricity. Her eyes were wide and shocked. I looked back towards Cooper who lay dead on the ground beside me, and blood found out behind his head. His revolver lay under his jaw and that boyish smile had lingered on his face. The sky went dark for a moment before lighting back up again, seemingly brighter than before. And Kenneth swayed uneasily on her feet, not dead, but for the time, wounded. She pressed a hand to her head and I took the window that I could. I couldn't shoot her, and I sure as hell wasn't about to shoot myself, but maybe I could find another way to hurt her. I pulled her away from Starkman and threw her to the ground. Kenneth rolled against the stone floor before picking herself up, her lips curled back into an animalistic snarl. You struggle in vain, she barked as I closed in on her. I hit her jaw and felt the force of my own blow against my face. Another bolt of crimson lightning struck beside me blowing apart the ground underneath my feet and sending me flying. 
You have nothing, she cried. No means to stop this. Your best efforts are too little and too late. And I saw Starkman try to stand, only for another bolt of crimson lightning to strike between us, lodging us both again. Starkman rolled slowly on the ground before starting to pick himself up. Not exactly, he rasped, glaring up at Kennard as he made it to his knees, and she towered over him, raw electricity sparking across her body, her brow furrowed in confusion. That power you got, it ain't yours, is it? Now I don't know a hell of a lot about gods or robberies, lady, but I know that if you're stealing anything from anyone, you might want to be a little bit quieter. For a moment, the sky above us went dark, and it took me a moment to pick up on what Starkman had already figured out. And looking up, I realized that the unnatural sky above us, it wasn't a sky. The sky, it doesn't blink. Kennard looked up, her eyes growing wide as the sky pulled backwards, shrinking further and further back to reveal the rest of the massive, dark thing that had been watching us. I couldn't pick out its true shape from the darkness of the void behind it, but its countless pink eyes looked like stars in the sky. No, Kenneth said, her voice little more than a frightened whisper. No, 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 please. She shrank backwards towards the great doors that had led us into that cursed world, but she could have moved fast enough. Starkman wore a wry smile as he watched her, although his smile quickly faded as dark tendrils crept over the land around us. Kenneth froze dead in her tracks, dumbstruck as she looked up at them. No matter at her fate, I was sealed. That lone drone sounded once more from the darkened sky as a great red cross appeared in it, and shall, in all of its great and terrible glory. Kenneth looked into the horizon, into that terrible cross, and she opened her mouth as if she were about to beg, but she never got chance. One of the dark tendrils shot down to water and forced itself into her mouth, and tears streamed from her eyes as it pushed its way down her throat. I saw her body going stiff as she tried to fight it, before her limbs slowly began to slacken. The tendril kept moving down her throat like a great endless snake, and her skin grew paler and paler until it was almost as white as snow. Even her hair seemed to fade to white. Starkman looked at her, watching as the tendril slid quickly down into her body before finally seeming to disappear. And at last, Kenneth fell to her knees, struggling to breathe and retching as she were about to vomit. Her arms trembled, her eyes seemed to glow an ominous red, and then, at last, she spat up something pale and milky white. It seemed to sizzle and burn on the ground before it evaporated. And at last, all was silent. It was a few moments before we heard Kennard begin to laugh, and Starkman slowly picked himself up, his pistol in hand, and placed it to her head, and teeth gritted in rage. And Kennard barely even looked up at him. She instead looked down at her own hands, flexing her fingers and turning her wrists. No, no! Why won't you fucking die? Starkman hissed. At last, Kennard looked up at him, her eyes pitch black and with blood red irises. Starkman's gun dissolved inside his hand, fading away into dust that slipped through his fingers. And I felt my own gun doing the same. When he stumbled back a step, eyes focused on Kennard as she rose to her feet. It's a shame she had such promise. But I suppose I may have been too lenient. Well, it hardly matters. She got her wish, I suppose. She? Starkman asked. Don't be dense, gentlemen. I think you're both far beyond that. Kennard brushed off her dress before looking over at me. You're, you're not Kennard, I said slowly. Are you? Primrose Kennard longed for the power of a god. I simply gave her what she wanted. 
But unfortunately, there isn't room for her and I together. I suppose it might be fun to manifest for a while. It's been some time since I bothered. But let's not linger. The abyss is such a dull place sometimes. And I'd very much like to go a walk. And with that, Kennet, or what I suppose used to be Primrose Kennet, turned and made her way to the great doors on the wall. Starkman watched her for a moment before moving to follow her. I knelt down beside Cooper and picked up his body to carry it back. The temple on the other side of the abyss was quieter than it had been before when we returned and Kennet looked around as if she had never seen it before. You shall, Starkman asked warily, and kept his distance from the woman as if she was a viper ready to bite him. I've been called many names by many iterations of this universe. But if that's what you care to call me, then by all means, she said, and Starkman eyed her mistrustfully. If you're the god of destruction, what are you here for? I asked. To end the world? In due time, but not right now, Shao replied. No, as I said, right now I'm here for a walk. There's so much to see, so much to take in. I like to savor my food, know what it is that I'm consuming before I consume it. A few centuries outside the abyss, and then we'll see. Her eyes fixated on Starkman, and then on me. Perhaps you might join me. I wouldn't mind some company. And Starkman was silent for a moment. He glanced at me, and then back at Shao. My brother. He finally said, Could you undo what Kenneth did to him? Darling, I could show you how to do it yourself, and then some. Her lips curled into a knowing grin. What do you say? And Starkman, he didn't answer at first, and it was a few moments before he took a step forward to take a place at Charles' side. He looked back at me, her eyes meeting for the last time. I didn't know what to say to him, if I should stop him or go with him instead. And so instead, I just stared back at him. You take care of yourself, Roy, he finally said, before nodding and heading for the tunnel. And Shao let him lead, and looked back at me with a wry smile on her face. And then, just like that, she was gone too. I stayed in that chamber with Cooper's body before I carried him outside. Starkman, hanged, and Kennet were long gone, and when I got there, I doubted I'd ever see them again, for better or for worse. I have taken the time to bury Marshall Cooper and to close the tunnel leading into the mountains. I am tired. There are horses that I can take and supplies to bring with me. Part of me longs to go home, but after the things I have seen, I'm not so sure I'll ever be quite the same man I was before. I think I will bury this journal with a marshal and set out for the wilderness. If I make it back to the Guadalupe Mountains, I will find Sarah and Jack and I will leave Texas behind and never look back. I'm not sure if what we now let into this world is something that should be here or not. Even if it isn't, I know there's not a damn thing I could do to stop it anyway. Either way, What's done is done, and the road calls to me. I do not know what lies in wait, and perhaps that is a mercy. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. Certainly another one. Wow. Absolutely chest-pounding and riveting storyline once again from the incredibly talented Head of Spectre over on Reddit. Guys and girls, if you're looking to keep yourself occupied during a dull day, why not head over to Head of Spectre's Reddit page, smash an upvote and smash a follow. You can certainly lose yourself for a number of hours with the amount of content available. 
As ever, Head, an absolute pleasure working with you. I really do hope you enjoy my rendition. And I cannot wait to uh, see you start publishing your work elsewhere. Guys and girls, you know the drill. As ever, please do let us know what you thought down below in the comments box. Please do like and share. It really does help build the channel and our community further. And why not hashtag Team Fear and DMT's Cryptid Crew. If you're an aspiring writer or just fancy having a crack at things, why not get in touch with myself at the usual email as on screen, which is DMT to Fear at gmail.com. I really look forward to hearing from you. I hope everybody's well this week and having a great time at school or work, getting fully stuck in and pushing for greatness. But above all guys, remember, be safe, not sorry.